<laughs> Please rise as the light of Christ comes into the sanctuary. Today, if you need to go to the nursery, Fuller Kate is here and ready to rock. 
And uh, if you go, she'll see you go, and she'll go in there and rock pass. Yeah? Thanks. So any other announcements? Any other announcements? No? All right. So, uh, so as we move into worship, right? As we move into and Jay, I set you up on that. Yeah, we're already done. As we move into worship, I want to I call your attention to Psalm 31. And, uh, and I think this is, this is pretty significant. It's pretty relevant. It's a reminder of who God is for us. And uh, as we move into worship and we'll sing together after this, I, just, I want you to hear this. So David wrote this. In you, O oh Lord, do I take refuge. Who here needs refuge this week? Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock. You are my fortress. And for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me and you take me out of the net that they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. And into your hand I commit my spirit, you have redeemed me. Now listen to this. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. Did you hear that, church? He didn't say I will rejoice because you kept me from affliction. He said, I will rejoice because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul. He didn't say you've kept me from distress. He said, you've known the distress of my soul. And you've del not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. And you've set my feet in a broad place. Hey, church, sometimes we come in here and we say, how are you? Wonderful. I've got no problems at all. But if we're real, man, we come in here with problems, right? We come in here with affliction. We come in here with stress. We come in here with trouble. All God's children got trouble. <laughs> he sees you in that. He walks with you in that. He knows you in that. And He will not leave you alone in that. So we come in here today. We need to switch that out. Very good. We come in here today and we say, Lord, we need you in this place today because I've got stress and I've got affliction. So let's come in here and let's be real. Let's say a prayer and then we'll sing praises to God. Heavenly Father, you are our God. You are mighty and you are powerful and we need you. We would ask that you would be with us in the midst of affliction and in the midst of stress and that you would hold us tight. We ask that in Jesus' name as we lay our hearts before you and worship you. In your name we pray, amen. Church, let's stand and let's sing together. I sing the power, I sing the almighty power of God.
have a seat and uh, will somebody tell Phil I got that? I got Thanks. <coughs> hey, so as we move into a time of prayer and testimony, is there anybody in here who has some prayer requests or praises that they'd like to share today? Thanks for sharing that, Judy. That's great. People don't get together anymore, man. Yeah. My hey. mom's neighbor, Bruce Weiss, he's uh, been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. He's had some surgery coming up Friday. What's the name? Bruce Weiss. W-E-I-S-T. <coughs> okay. I think he has bone cancer. So remember Bruce and Trump. Okay. Brother Ronnie and Sherry, they've We'll continue to pray for the Brown family. Uh, continue to play, pray for the Blackwellers as Chad starts radiation tomorrow. <coughs> Who else? Matt McKnight. You got eye surgery Wednesday, Joe? All right, we'll be praying for you. Matt McKnight. Matt McKnight. Got it. Who else? Cammy Webb. Say it again. Cammy Webb. Tammy Webb. Cammy. Cammy. Cam. Sure. You got it. Who else? Tom Ballant. Tom Ballant? Yeah, he's my college roommate. Yeah. Fighting yeah. Parkinson. Who else? Priscilla Dwiggins. <coughs> Priscilla Dwiggins. You got it, Jerry. Priscilla Dwiggins. Who else? My cousin, uh, Patsy Harris. She has a bunch of tests run Wednesday of this week. And her sister, Carolyn Price, she has no vision. You say Carolyn Price? Yes, sir. Thank you. You got it. Who else? Jim Mattern. M A T T E R, Matt? Mattern, in the end of the end. Okay. Who else? Hey, that's a long list. Here's what that means. Here's what a sign of a long list is. Number one, folks are in need, right? Number two, we're praying for folks. Right? They're on your heart because God's put them on your heart. So you're going to pray to church. So, uh, you know, some things are said out loud. Some things are said in private. But we've got a long list because we've got a heart for people. So let's take our heart for people before the Lord right now. And ask Him to intervene in their lives and our lives. Okay? 
Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you and we praise you because you are good and you are like no other and no other is like you. Father, that you are that powerful and that mighty and that holy that no one could even be in your presence outside of the grace that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ. You're that good and you shower that on us. And God, we would pray this morning that we would feel that, that you would shower that on us. And even more than we would feel it, that we would know it, that our hearts would be assured, that our minds would be solid in the fact that you are in this place and that you walk with us wherever we go. Father, that we would be assured of your presence as much as we are, are assured of the fact that we need you. Open our eyes to the fact that we need you. Lord, we have friends and family who are struggling. Lord, we are struggling. Lord, it's a tough world. This is a tough place sometimes. And some days are easier than others and some days are rough. But Lord, we need you in the good and the bad. And Father, the names that we just lifted up, Father, we lay before you with open heart and vulnerability and we say, Lord, help. We need you to help. Father, there are those that were said that we wrote down. There are those that we pray for every week. There are those that went unsaid this morning that are on our hearts that are dear to us. <clears throat> but it does not compare to how dear they are to you. And so, Father, we lift them up to you and ask that where there would be healing, that you would heal. Lord, where hearts would be open, that you would open hearts. Lord, that where there is struggle, that you would walk with in the midst of distress, that you would not leave in the midst of pain and trouble, but that you would reach down, that you would pull out, that you would walk with, that you would wash off, that you would clean up, that you would hold tight in the middle of a muddy mess, that you would cling to those folks as you cling to us and use us wherever you see fit. Jesus, that your spirit would move in our hearts today, that you would open your word to tell us the truth, that you would use your spirit to convict us of the truth, that you would encourage our hearts as we walk forward in the truth. Lord, that you would have your way with us. Break us where we need breaking, heal us where we need healing, and grow us where we need growth. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name, and we pray together the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue to worship God with our tithes and our offerings today. Heavenly Father, you are good. We give back to you what is yours. We ask that you bless these gifts and that you give us the wisdom and the discernment to use them for your kingdom moving forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So they said, you're going to look presentable. You're going to look respectful, right? They also said, hey, you're not going to have an earring. Uh, that way, it was three boys and uh, my mom and dad. And they said, one lady, one person in this house will have an earring. That's not biblical. That was the sink house, right? So don't confuse those two things. But their, their directive was, hey, let's not have an earring. Well, a lot of my friends had earrings. And so at 18, I remember I was out with a buddy. And uh, we were in town, and there was this place that had this special. It was like 15 bucks. We'll pierce your ear and give you a little stud in your ear. And I was 18, and so I thought, well, I've abided by the rules for quite a while, right? So I'll go get myself an earring. And uh, I went with my buddy, Charlie, and we went there. And Charlie got his pierced, and I reached in my pocket, and I had 12 bucks. 12, which is 11 more than I typically had at the time. And I had 12 bucks, and I said, dang. Well, I don't have enough today. I'll come back tomorrow. And so I went home that night. We were around the supper table. And, uh, and I said just randomly, hey, we were at the place today. They said 15 bucks for an earring. I'm going to go back tomorrow because I didn't have enough today. Pass the mashed potatoes. <laughs> My dad never skipped a beat. Never skipped a beat. He didn't even look up. He said, how much did you say that was going to cost you? I said, 15 bucks. They said, that's pretty interesting, man. I said, how's that? He said, because I've told you that my children will not have an earring. And I pay for room, board, and food for my children. And so if you go get an earring, it may cost you a little more than 15 bucks. Because you'll be paying rent, and you'll be paying groceries, and you'll be paying all the gasoline, not half of it. And I said, you know, I never really wanted an earring. <laughs> here's, here's the deal. I, I thought I had the power. I thought I had the control. I did not. The power was not mine, it was my father's. He was, he's also a good, kind man, by the way. Here's, here's what I want you to remember today. The power is not yours or mine. It is our Father's. And we're going to see that in this text. In Acts chapter 12, the last couple of weeks, we've seen some things happen. We've seen some powerful things happen, and we've seen some head-scratching things happen. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about unanswered prayers a little bit. We saw in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, that Herod had James, the brother of John, killed. He had him executed. Surely there was a church praying for James. And we talked about sometimes we just don't understand God's will, and sometimes timing is different, and sometimes we just won't know here. And we've got to keep praying, and we've got to keep believing, and we've got to hold on to that faith. Last week we talked about some answered prayers. How Peter was in prison and that same church kept praying. Despite the fact James had been executed. Despite the fact that uh, Stephen had been executed. And Christians and believers were being locked up. They continued to pray. And their prayers were answered. And an angel showed up in Peter's prison cell. And remember he struck him on the side. And he said Peter get ready to go. We're busting out of here. And remember, Peter's chains miraculously fell off. And then Peter followed the directive of that angel. And he followed him out of the prison, through the gates, to the church that was praying for him in someone's house. Knocked on their door and finally got the church to open. God was still in control. God was powerful enough to release Peter from prison. And God was powerful enough to keep the church going in spite of adversity. That's a powerful God. God kept marching on. Now, we get to the end of chapter 12 and something interesting happens. Because Herod, who was in charge, if you didn't believe it, just ask Herod. Herod was in charge and Herod was the man who had James killed. Herod was the man who had Peter imprisoned. Herod was also in the 
verses leading up to this, the man, the king who had the guards executed, once Peter was discovered as missing. So several months pass, and we get to verse 20. There's several months between 19 and 20. We get to chapter 12, verse 20, and listen to this. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. He was tired of the people at Tyre and he was beside himself with people of Sidon. Whatever. He was angry with them. And they came to him with one accord and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. So Herod is a ruler in charge. He's the king. He's mad. He's moody. He's angry with Tyre and Sidon, these two regions. And he said, you know what? No more food. Import, export. Right? He said, we will not be exporting any more food to you. Because I don't like you right now. Whatever the reason, he cut them off. Well, since ancient times, since the beginning of their time, they depended on Herod's region for food. They got no food. So the people of Tyre and Sidon say they, they, they kind of weasel their way in, right? They make friends with Blastus, the chamberlain, so a big cupbearer, always beside of the king. He's got this great relationship with the king. So people in Tyre and Sidon say, let's go in the back door. Let's make friends with Blastus. They make friends with Blastus. He sets up an appointment with the king. Verse 21, maybe. I can't, I, I can't even see it because my eyesight's so bad. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting the voice of God and not of a man. Now don't miss this. Here put on his royal robes. Josephus in, in church history and in Christian history and some other Christian historians say Herod's robe was made of silver and gold. Anybody watch Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer every year at Christmas? Silver and gold. Remember Courtney? That's my favorite guy, right? Anyway. All right. So they were made of silver and gold. Right? Now, more silver than gold, but he doesn't say, church historians don't say, well, they were silver colored. They were gold colored. No. It was a robe made of silver and gold. The cost of the robe that Herod put on for his appointment with people that were starving, the cost of that road could have fed those regions for, for ages. And he sets up this meeting and he said, I want everyone to know how important I am. And he puts on this robe made of silver and gold. And he walks into the amphitheater where the sun is shining down on the open space. And the sun catches his robe of silver and gold and he shines, illuminates. And he walks out and he sits down on his throne and he delivers an oration. A speech. And man, it was smooth. And everyone there says, oh, King Herod, it's the voice of a God. Now, what's the motive of everyone there? They need to get fed. So he could have come out in rags and said nothing. And they would have said, you're a friend. Right? But he's delivering this speech and they say, it's the voice of a God, a lowercase g God. Herod, you're incredible. And Herod said, no, 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 no. Tell me. Tell me. He soaked in the glory. He soaked in the praise. The people were shouting the voice of a God and not a man. And what happened? Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down. Why? Because he did not give God the glory. Now check this out, everybody who's anxious for lunch afterward. <laughs> and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Eaten by worms. The phrase eaten by worms in Greek is skolo kabrotos. The root word, I'm reading that. I don't know that by heart. The root word skolax means a specific head structure of a tapeworm. 
The rupture of a cyst may release as many as 2 million other tapeworms. When the cyst ruptures, the entrance of cellular debris along with the scolices may cause sudden death. It's the same term eaten by worms used in Mark chapter 9 verse 44 when Jesus is talking about hell. When I, was, uh, when I was a kid, I heard somebody say a story of how they were once in class at another school and this kid was at his table and he, he just started kind of messing with his nose, maybe picking it a little, and all of a sudden pulls out this worm. <laughs> right out of his nose. <laughs> inch after inch after inch. <laughs> Now that's something you don't get over in school. That's, I mean, you got a, you got a name for it. You're wormy for the rest of your life. <laughs> but he pulled it out. Look, like I said, good luck for lunch. Who's having spaghetti? <laughs> no. Look, but but this this instance, there, whatever the case, it says the the term is used as a tapeworm, and and that would have been a common tapeworm with sheep and cattle in that area, just ruptured, kaboom. However God wanted to do it, God did it. And Herod fell dead on the spot. Now listen. Because we may not like this. What happened to Herod when he killed James? Nothing. What happened to Herod when he locked up Peter? Nothing. Nothing. What happened to Herod when he took the glory that belonged to God? Bam! Worms! Dead! Now listen. Our life as believers, as children of God, and man, when I say things like, like this, can I just be transparent with you? I, I say things like our... <laughs> Because I'm talking about me, okay? Our lives as children of God center around who? Us. Our nature centers around us. If, you, if you've got a picture, if, if there was a picture of you and 30 other people, and, and somebody sends you that on the phone, or they show you that picture, or it's hanging on your wall, for the first time, at least the very first time you look at it, who's the first person you look at in that picture of 30? It's you. It's you. you. You want to see how you look. If, if they took 12 pictures, right, and you're standing in front of a big fountain, hey stranger, could you take this picture? Well, before I post this or send this to anybody, I'm going to make sure I don't look goofy in this picture. <laughs> yes? Yes. We are wired to look out for ourselves. It's not how this works. Our relationship with God should be bent toward bowing to God and looking at God and letting God do the work on us. But that's against our nature. We've got these two natures in us just battling all the time. Right? And so what I hope we're going to see today is the work of surrender in our hearts to the one who's really in control. Because we may think that we're in control, but there will be moments in our lives where we find out who's in control. And I pray that that moment will come sooner than later. King Herod was not in control. There's an old story, a true story about a king, King Canute, called Canute the Great. King Canute the Great. And, and King Canute was a powerful king. Right, he was king of England, uh, Scotland, some other places. He was the overlord of Scotland. And that's like a not, overlord is a real thing, apparently. Like I think when I think overlord, I think like Darth Vader, overlord, <laughs> right? But he was overlord of Scotland. He was king of England. He conquered lands. He was Canute the Great. He abolished heavy taxes for people way back in the day. He, he brought his country out of debt. Everyone loved King Canute. And the story goes that as his popularity was at its height, King Canute went down by 
the shore, had a large crowd there because everybody said, if nobody else can do it, King Canute can do it. He's the master of everything. He's the king of kings. And King Canute took his throne to the seashore and he watched for the tide to roll out. And then the tide started rolling in and Canute said, set my throne right here. And he got up and he sat down on his throne and he said, tide. I command you not to come in. Do not wet my feet. Do not wet my robe. Because everyone in this kingdom knows that when King Canute gives an order, everyone and everything listens. Well, what did the tide do? It came in. He got his feet wet, and he got his robe wet, and he was a big sandy mess. And, and really, most folks would end the story there. Right? What he did was he stood up and he said, hey, the, the rest of the story, Paul Harvey, the rest of the story says King Canute stood up and he said to everyone, you see, there is a power greater than mine. And it is the one true God. And what Herod did not understand is there is a power greater than him. I want, you to, I want you to see two things today as we talk. I need you to tuck this away. God is powerful. God is personal. God is powerful. He created everything that was here. Everything that is here. Now I'm talking to believers right now. Do you believe that God is powerful? Do you believe that God can do anything that He wants to do? He created everything from nothing. He split the Red Sea and made the ground dry so that His people could go through. He made the sun stand still in the sky for Joshua. He rose. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. God is powerful. Do you believe that God is powerful? Give me a head nod or a thumbs up or an amen. amen. Do you believe that God is powerful? God is powerful. Listen, that's an undisputed fact. And I don't need to convince you of that. Like Spurgeon said, I don't need to convince you of the Bible. I just need to let the lion out of its cage and let it do the work. Right? And so I would say, if you know God, you know that He is powerful. He is not just powerful. He's all powerful. He's not just a powerful being. He's the powerful being. He can do anything that he wants to do. He is God. And so we come to him and we pray for his power to come and take place in our lives. But what's the problem? What stops us? What's the obstacle from saying, oh yeah, you're powerful. I need you to work this work in my life. I think it's because we don't believe he's personal. Well, okay. I, I may have told you this story before. And if I did, that's okay because I'm not under the impression that you remember everything I'm saying. Right? But, but I, had, I had some friends, and it, it, it applies here. So I, I had some friends, this is a, a true story also, but I had some friends who had, uh, their mom was in a nursing home in Virginia. Right? Their mom was in a nursing home in Virginia, and their mom was a bit of a troublemaker. Right? This is my friends Tracy and her mom. Her mom was a little bit of a troublemaker, and, and I'm, I have an affinity for that because my grandma was also a troublemaker, and I, I like troublemakers, right? And so, so her mom was a troublemaker, and every weekend they would go see her mom in Virginia, and they would travel up there, and every weekend it was something new. What's she done now? What's mama done now? What do we need to apologize to for the nurses and the other residents? And so Tracy said, we went up there one, one weekend. And we got to, to my mom's room. She said, we were about to walk in, and there was a black circle on the ground in the doorway. A black decal. Manhole size black circular decal. Right on the ground in the doorway. And she looked at her husband and she said, Lord, what's mama done now? She said, she's been blackballed. She's on the black list, and nobody's going to help her. So Tracy said she went to the desk and she said, what's she done now? And the nurse said, well, the problem is if you're a mom, we have another resident. It's a man and he wanders in other rooms and in, in particular ladies' rooms. And we're trying to keep him out of the ladies' rooms. And this man is scared to death of holes. 
<laughs> so, so we placed black manhole size stickers on the ground. The meanest nurse at home, man. But, but it worked. Right? And she said this man would come up and he would see that hole and he would turn around. Because he wouldn't go in the room where there was a hole. Now the hole wasn't really there. He could have walked where he wanted to walk. But he was convinced there was an obstacle in his way. Now listen, when, when we approach God, and I mean we approach a powerful God. Read his word. It's a, he is a powerful God. And we approach him in prayer and we approach him in our daily lives and we walk this walk with him. But I'm convinced that a lot of us see an obstacle that is not there. I'm convinced that a lot of us see a powerful God who may not deeply care enough about our own lives to intervene. I think that's something we would not necessarily say out loud. But I think that a lot of us have dealt with prayers that we didn't see an answer to. Situations that are hard and we felt like they shouldn't be that hard for believers. And at some point along the way, we became a little numb in our hearts and in our minds. And we created an obstacle between us and God that's not there. Watch this. Let me unpack Acts 13. Just the uh, first 12 verses. Let me unpack Acts 13 and, and we're going to get an answer to this, okay? Because God is powerful. That's an undisputed fact. But is God personal? Does He know you? Does He care about you? And is He interested in working in your life? Check this out. 13.1 now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and who? Saul. And while they were worshiping, listen to that. While they were worshiping, while they were worshiping, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. What, you, you know what we do when we want direction in our life? We say, Lord, give me direction. Lord, show me where to go. Lord, show me what to do. And that's, that's good. Ask him to help you. We know what we do not do. We don't worship first. We don't spend time just telling him how good he is. We don't spend time just laying our hearts before him and worshiping. And what these guys did is they said we need direction. And the first thing we need to know is God is good and he loves us and we worship him. So they went before God and they worshiped him. And then God said through the Holy Spirit, let me tell you, I want these guys and I want them to go this way. And they said, okay. Verse 4. So... Being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salimus, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John, that's John Mark, who was in the house, Mary's house, with Peter chapter 12. They had John to assist them. And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician. David Copperfield, now I'm just making sure you're paying attention. There was a magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. A Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. And he was with the proconsul. Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. All right, so you got Bar-Jesus, he's a magician. Not good. You got Sergio Paulus who said, Barnabas, Saul, we need to hear the word of God. 
Good. But Elimus, that's Bar Jesus, Elimus the magician, for that is the meaning of his name. So Greek magician Elimus, same guy. Opposed them, opposed Barnabas and Saul, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, watch this, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Now this is significant, right? This is not the this is not the, the crux of what we're talking about today, but it is significant about what we're talking about today. Up to now, he's been Saul. Now Luke says his name is Paul. And for the rest of Acts, he'll be Paul. And here's why this is significant. You know what Saul means? Do you remember your Old Testament Bible students? The first king of Israel, Saul. His name was Saul. Saul means sought after. Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. If you remember the description in the Old Testament, King Saul was this mighty, tall, good-looking man. Because for whatever reason, people think if you're tall, you're good-looking. And that's a, that's a heresy. That's not even true. But he was tall, and he was good-looking. His name was, was Saul. And it literally means, his word means sought after. He was sought after. People said, man, Saul. We want to know Saul. Make him our king. Saul. You know what Paul means? Small. Paul means small. Humble. Low. Saul means power. Paul means small. Luke is purposefully saying, because there's no accidents here. Luke is purposefully saying, Saul gave up his power. Paul started ministering. And Paul would say the same thing later. All my credentials that I used to have, I now consider worthless, and the interpretation is dog dung. Once again, good luck eating today. Worms and dog dung, right? He said all those other things, I now consider dog dung. Worthless. All those things that used to make me important, no. Nah. Except for the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Paul is not obsessed with power. Paul is humble and low. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at Bar Jesus and said, You son of the devil. Come on now. You son of the devil. You enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, listen, and you will be blind and unable to see, unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Now check this out. Check this out. So, so we say, boom, God, that's what I'm talking about. Paul had trouble with an enemy. You struck him blind. God, also, I have sent some enemies, and I would like you to do the same. And if I just go out and tell my enemy, you son of a devil, I wish you would just strike them blind. And that's what we do, right? We see Jesus turning over tables, and we say, that's my Jesus. I want Jesus to rock in and turn over some tables, right? Well, what if the tables he's turning over are the ones in your own heart? Maybe you don't want to turn it over the you, you see what God did here. We're power obsessed, right? We're centrally obsessed. So we say, yeah, God, knock him blind. Knock him out. Woo! Now check this out, though, because if you've been paying attention in Acts, this is a similar situation from what we've already seen. There was a guy, Bar Jesus, Elimus. He was standing in opposition to the gospel. The gospel is rolling through, and this guy stands and says, I'm opposed. I don't want people to hear. And then we see this man, Bar Jesus, Elimus, struck blind for a temporary amount of time. Does that sound familiar to anybody that we've seen in the book of Acts? 
Do you remember Saul, mighty Saul, and what his entire life's purpose was before Jesus knocked him off of his horse? It was to stand in opposition of the gospel. Do you remember what happened to Saul, mighty Saul? He was struck blind temporarily. And so we want to read it the way that I read it. You son of a devil, you made me struck blind right now. I, I almost think we're reading that with the wrong tone. Because if anybody gets this guy, it's Saul. And if anybody understands that sometimes God has to take your power down in order for him to be displayed in your life, it's Saul who's now Paul. And so Paul looks at this man, probably broken, and says, You son of a devil. You're standing in opposition of the gospel. And out of God's mercy, he's going to strike you blind for a certain amount of time so that you can see. <coughs> now we're going to come back to that. Here's, here's, what I, here's what I need you to know. Now listen, if, if you've been drifting and you're wondering how this all ties together, this is the time to come back. Because this is critical to your walk with Christ. Not because your teacher is so smart, but because this is critical and the Lord needs you to know this. God is powerful. Fact. Is he personal? Your church answer is yes, of course he's personal. But that may be true. Because he's personal so he knows me. Well, does he know me? I don't know. Does, does God know me? Well, check this out. Psalm 139. You can write it down or you can turn there. Psalm 139. Does God know me? Psalm 139. Can you remember that this week? Does God know me? Psalm 139. Lord, you searched me and known me. You know when I sit up, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. Holy moly, you know every thought. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Not some of my ways, not the way I did yesterday, all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue. You know it all together. Have you been driving down the road and somebody pulled out in front of you? Mm. You hem me in behind me and before me and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high and I cannot attain it. Where should I go? Where can I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. And if I say, surely the darkness covers me and the light about me, even the darkness is not dark to you. Even the night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light to, to you. Listen, for you formed me in my inward parts. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. When you were just a baby forming in your mother's womb, God knit you together. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Listen, he goes on. He goes on and he goes on and he goes on. And God knows you. He put you together. Anybody ever made anything? And, you, and you, when you see that thing you made, you were so proud of it. You know, uh, when I was a kid, man, in shop class, uh, we made, and this was like sixth grade shop class, we made this uh, pie pan art. We took a nail and a pie pan, and we made this little design. We made this little design with uh, colored thread. We put a nail and a block of wood, and we colored the thread. We made this big star. It's on my parents' wall. I'm 45 years old. It's on my parents' wall. You know, when I come home, I'm like... <laughs> I made that. <laughs> Guess who made you? Guess who made you? And when he sees you, he smiles at you. And he says, I made him. I made her. I put them together. While they were still babies forming in their mama's womb, I put them together. 
I know everything about it. I know what they think. I know where they've been. I know where they're going. I made that. Okay. He knows it. Okay. Here's a question, saints. This is a question. Does he like me? Does he like me? Because you, because you may say, okay, well, God has to love me. I'll bet you do this with other people. Because <laughs> you, you're a Christian. And I bet you say, well, Jesus said love him, but I don't have to like him. <laughs> and maybe because we're so twisted up, we think that about God too. Maybe we say, God says, I got to love him, but I don't like him. Maybe we think God doesn't take delight in us. Maybe you've had relationships in your life like this. That there are people you love, but that are hard to like. And I mean this in a real way. Maybe you've had a wayward child that you love, but they're caught up in mess, they're caught up in things that they shouldn't be caught up in, and you have to deal with that and unpack that, and, and rescue them and hold them and walk through all that with you. And that's not a delight. You love them. Oh, you love them. But it's hard to like that moment. Maybe you, you've been in a relationship with a spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend and, and you said, man, I love them and I'll never stop loving them. But, but it's hard to like this right now. And we take that human thinking and we apply it to God and we say, God, I know you love me, but do you like me? I want to talk about that for just a minute because I think this is a game changer in your faith. If you could wake up in the morning and you could say, not only God loves me, but he likes me. And, he, and that powerful God who can do whatever he wants delights in me. Listen, listen. So, so there, are, there are two aspects of God's love, right? There is God's benevolence. And that, that means God loves you. But benevolence, goodwill towards someone or something that doesn't deserve it, that didn't do anything to earn it. That's benevolence, right? We have a benevolence fund. So, so you, you donate money to a cause that doesn't necessarily earn it, work its way to it, but you give it. So God does have benevolence, right? This is the God loves you part. So God has a benevolent love. In other words, what does Paul say? While we were sinners, God loved us. God rescued us. God gave us his son. He saw us in our state of sin. And listen, we weren't like him. We weren't chasing God. We, 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 we didn't know him. We were fighting against him like Paul. We were kicking against the goats. But God's benevolence says, I love you. So I will take that move. Open your heart. Knock on your heart. We open our heart. God comes in. His benevolence pours out that love on us. God loves us. He is benevolent. Okay? I don't think most of us have trouble with it. Most believers have trouble with that. God loves us. He gave me his son. Now look, that's, that's foundational to step two. So, so if you say, I'm a believer, but I'm not sure God loved me enough to give me his son, well, well, well right. There's some work to do. You need to examine your heart. You need to know God loved you. That's a fact. So much that he gave his son. Now, he loves me, but does he like me? He loves me, but does he like me? So God loved me. He gave me his son. We've started this relationship. 
right? But does he delight in me? Genesis 1, 3 says God made this creation and it was good. He delighted in it. We were little babies. We man, we God loved us. But then sin messed that up. Sin came into our lives and messed things up. And Romans chapter 8, verse 7 says this, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Look, there's no sweet way to say it. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So if I, if I haven't given my life over to Christ, I am incapable of pleasing God. We like to think God's a kind old grandpa in the sky, and he says, it's okay. You don't really have to give me your life. I love you anyway. I'm, I'm too nice to send anybody to hell. Romans chapter 8, verse 7 says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So here's a question first. Is your life in the flesh or is your life in the spirit? Is your life about sin and enjoying that and hoping you get it good enough one day? That's the flesh. Or is your life in the spirit where you are completely dependent on Christ? Ah. But if we looked at the rest of that verse... You, however, believers, you, you believe in Jesus? Is he your Savior? You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. So listen, here's the deal. Does God delight in me? He delights in me if I know Him and the Holy Spirit has begun to work in me. So listen, are there things in my life that I say, God, I know, I, I'm convicted of this, and, 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 and I need to repent of that. I need to step away from that. I need to ask forgiveness. That's the Holy Spirit is working in your life, and the Holy Spirit is saying, that stuff's no good for you. I, you don't need to be over here. You need to be over here. And so the Holy Spirit will start to work in your life, and it will start to transform you. Well, look, the Trinity says the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, three in one, right? So the work of God in your life is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, which is the work of God in your life. So to say that God would not be pleased and delight in his own work would be silly. If God is working in your life, he delights in your life. And you know what he does? He looks at you and he says, I did that. That's my key. And we like to think of it as quantitative. In other words, right now I'm only 49% there of the life that I should be living. But when I get 51% there, then God will like me. That's not what God does. God sees, it. that's what we do. That's not what God does. God sees any incremental work in our lives and he says, oh, yeah, I delight in that. You know, if, if you had a kid or a grandkid and you taught them how to do something, Right? Or, or a friend's kid and you taught them how to do something. You saw that kid do it. You said, they learned that from me. It may not be the greatest habit, right? But Jesus said, they learned that from me. And that makes me happy. And God looks at you and he sees this work that's being done in your life. And he says, they learned that from me. And that makes me happy. When I was a kid, man, we used to pass notes in school if we liked a girl. Right? And, and it was poetic. Right? So we would take a, we'd take a sheet, sheet of paper. Man, and I'd see, I'd see this pretty blonde. Over there. And I'd say, uh, I'd say, hey, you're pretty blonde. And I'd say, hey, Vince, you think she likes me? Don't answer. Don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, because uh, I've been eyeing her, and I think she's been eyeing me. And you know what I'd write on that sheet of paper? I'd say, I like you. Do you like me? <laughs> and I'd say check yes, no, or maybe. Maybe. <laughs> because you've got to leave the options open, Sam. Right? <laughs> and I'd fold it up. Right? And I'd wait until the teacher wasn't looking. What would it change in your life? What would it 
complete change in your life. If, if you heard God say, I like you. I like you. I delight in you. Listen, John Piper calls this a Bible bath. That's what, that's what he calls this. I, I want to read you about eight scriptures here. Quick, don't try to keep up. Just listen. If you want them later, I just dropped it. If you want them later, then uh, I'll email them to you, all right? So listen up. Psalm 35, 27. Great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. Jeremiah 32, 41. I will rejoice in doing them good, and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and my soul. I will rejoice. Zephaniah 3, 17. He will rejoice over you with gladness. That's God. God will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. And he will exult over you with loud singing. Those of crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord, but those of blameless ways are his delight. And you may say, uh-oh, that means i got to earn it. If you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you're blameless. And you are his delight. Isaiah 62, 4 says, You shall be called my delight. For the Lord delights in you. Psalm 147, 10, 11, His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor is His pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear Him, in those whose hope is His steadfast love. All you have to do is hope in God and tremble at His displeasure and your delight in Him. Proverbs 3, 11, The Lord reproves him who He loves, the Father and the Son, in whom He delights. Even when we're being disciplined, He delights in us. Psalm 149, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. He delights in you. If you would come before him and say, Jesus, I know you like me. Let's go. To know that he delights in you. I'll, I'll finish with this, okay? Man, well, I got to finish with this. So this, this, I got so much I want to tell you. Man, there's so much I want to tell you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, we got to stop I got so much I want to tell you about this, but check this out. So, so Acts 13, they're doing all this power, and, and Saul, now Paul, is this, is this broken man who he's been blind before, and now he sees this, this magician, Bar Jesus, who's blinded before, and, and, he, and he tells him, you know, you're going to be blind in a temporary amount of time, and, and these are broken, humble people, Paul and Barnabas, and they're coming before uh, these guys to minister, and check this out, there's just been this huge power of God, boosh, blindness. This magician is crippled. This opposition to the Lord is crippled. Verse 12. 12, uh, 13, 12. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred. Now listen, for he was astonished at the teachings of the Lord. This Sergio Paulus guy, he, he believed not because of the power. If you read that, 13, 12, he believed because of the teaching. He believed because of the gospel. So there was this incredible power that had just taken place. And this guy said, I believe not because of the power. I believe because of the teaching. I believe because of the gospel. I believe because this small, humble man spoke to this man who was in opposition. And there was this gospel power of love. And so our idea of power is to say, God, knock him out. And God's idea of power is to say, sometimes you have to be broken in order to get this. And our idea of power is to say, God, I need you to intervene right now. And God's idea of power is to say, Psalm 31, I will walk with you in the middle of distress. And my power may not look like your power. We won't look it up. Because I promise two more minutes and I'm done. I won't look it up, but you, you should look it up later. Exodus 25 and John 20. Exodus 25 and John 20. Sometimes we're reading through the Old Testament. We come on things like, no, like endless numbers and descriptions of sanctuaries and tabernacles. And we read through that. 
And we say, Lord, I know I'm supposed to read two or three chapters a day to stay on my Bible reading plan. And, but can I just skip this? Because I'll just skip it. Because this is probably not that important, right? We come And Exodus 25 kind of has one of these moments, right? Where it's talking about all these details of the tabernacle. But, but it starts to explain this thing called the mercy seat. And it says in Exodus 25, there's this mercy seat, right, in, inside uh, the sanctuary, inside where you, where you would go, right? The presence of God is here, and there's this mercy seat. And this mercy seat is there at the ark, and, and God says, I want you to, and all through the scripture, you've got visions of the Garden of Eden when God walked with man, and then you've got allusions to what's coming, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And you see this mercy seat in Exodus 25, where you will meet with God. And it says at the end of these, this mercy seat, on the left and the right, two angels are carved out. One at the head, one at the foot. And there in the middle, that's the mercy seat. Right? Dang on, I said I wasn't going to read it. I'm going to read it. Make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Make one angel on one end and one angel on the other end. Of one piece, and you shall make it. The mercy seat will be in the middle. And there, verse 22, there I will meet with you. And I'll talk to you, Moses. So you've got this mercy seat. You've got an angel on one end and an angel on the other end. This is where we meet with God. Check this out. John 20. Jesus has been... And Jesus has been on the cross. He's been sacrificed on the cross. Three days have passed and Mary Magdalene shows up to the tomb. 20 verse 11. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look in the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. One at the head and one at the foot. And then Mary turned around and she started weeping. The angel said, what you looking for? And she turned around and there's Jesus at the door. You read the rest of that verse by verse, right? And there's Jesus at the door and he says her name, Mary. And Mary says, Jesus. But there's this, this scene where you have this face and an angel at the head and an angel at the foot. And we have this Exodus 25, this mercy seat where you meet with God. And you have an angel at the head and an angel at the foot. Because everything in the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus, right? And so we get to the New Testament and we say, oh, there it is. And so where do I meet with God? Where do I meet with God humbly and say, I don't have the power, but you have the power. And sometimes I need to be broken. And, and I need you to break me if I need to be broken. And, and Lord, do you like me? Where do I go with that? You go to the mercy seat. Where's the mercy seat? Don't ever get confused. It's Jesus. Jesus is the mercy seat. And all we have to do is just say, Jesus, I come before you and I am helpless and hopeless and I need your help. I need to know that you delight in me. I need mercy. And he will meet you there and speak with you. Exodus 25. He will meet you there and speak with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus, we are in need of your mercy. We are in desperate need of you to meet with us and speak with us. Jesus, we got nowhere else to go. Speak to our hearts and let us know how much you love us and care for us and always have and always will. How much you delight in us and you like us. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, let's stand and let's sing together. I know I didn't give you the hymn number on the last one. This is your uh, black book. Uh, Black Hymnal 2162. 2162 in the Black Hymnal, Grace Alone. And as we sing, and you just need to come to the mercy seat and meet with Jesus, that if you need to be reminded that he likes you today, that's important. Let's stand and let's sing together.
I'll keep it short and sweet. You believe that, Nancy? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we would ask that you would go with us today. We would ask that your spirit would work in us, that you would continue the work that you've already done, because that's your promise. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Lord, carry on. Continue the work that you've done in us. And let us delight in you as you delight in us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.